So uh, let's get into this. Today we're going to have Dr. Jason Lyle here on the podcast. He is no stranger to this podcast. I've, I've had him on several times before. I think this is my third, maybe fourth time having him on. I've, I, I don't know. I lost count. Uh, but guys, uh, he really does know his stuff. He double majored in physics and astronomy and minored in mathematics. Uh, he's earned a master's degree and a PhD in astrophysics uh, at, at the University of Colorado. Uh, Dr. Lyle also, he specialized in solar astrophysics. He's made a number of scientific discoveries regarding the solar photosphere and has contributed to the field of general relativity. <laughs> I mean, he's got some uh, credentials behind him. So when he speaks on this subject, he knows what he's talking about. So without further ado, Dr. Jason Lyle, welcome back to the Youth Apologetics Training Podcast. Well, thanks. Good to be back. Well, absolutely. It's it's always a pleasure to have you. And I know every single time I have you on, uh, I just get this flood of comments. Uh, everybody loves hearing what you have to say. You just you have so much to bring to the table. Um, so friends, today we're going to be talking about something that Honestly, I struggled with for a couple months. I, I didn't even want to talk about it, but I continue to get questions about it. And that is, does the Bible teach that the earth is flat? And what does science have to say about it? Uh, believe it or not, there is a movement within Christianity that uh, seems to be suggesting, they're teaching that the earth is actually a flat disk and that there is, if you guys, if anybody has seen the Truman show, uh, and if you have, you're all heathens, just kidding. But <laughs> there is this movie where, uh, this guy, uh, Oh, Jim Carrey, I think. Yeah. Uh, he's in this contained little flat earth, if you will, and under a dome. And then they've got all these cameras running around filming his life. Well, that same kind of concept that the entire planet is just flat. It's just a disc. And then there is this domed sky. The dome is a solid, firm, set-in-place dome that surrounds the earth. Uh, and that somehow, uh, through uh, conspiracy and just uh, science being confused, we've missed this all along. Uh, never mind the fact that we've been to space. Uh, never mind so many different things. Uh, this movement is teaching this. Now, there is a lot of conspiracy that comes out of this movement, some, some uh, uh, tinfoil hattery, if you will, and, and uh, we're not going to touch that today so much, but really I just want to talk about what does the Bible say and what does science say about a flat versus a spherical earth. Um, first of all, Dr. Lyle, why does it even matter? Why would we take the time to even talk about something like this? You know, when I first started hearing about this, and it was only, it's only been really in the last year that this is sort of, I don't know, catching on or something. I mean, I, I always thought it was a myth that anyone believed in a flat earth today, and I thought it was sort of a joke when people brought it up. But uh, it turns out that some people apparently actually believe that, that the earth is, is, is flat and that, uh, you know, all the evidence to the contrary is just sort of a gigantic conspiracy theory and so on. And, and, and because it's it's gaining traction and because – Sadly, it's, it's mostly Christians who are, are falling for this. I felt, you know, it's probably time that we, we deal with this issue, because you see, if somebody professes to be a Christian, but they also claim something that is demonstrably false, that really tarnishes the name of Christianity. And I think that this can be, uh, I think that this can actually add to the offense of the gospel. The gospel is offensive enough by itself, and uh, it's, it's offensive in a, in a proper way because we're sinners, but we don't want to add to that offense by uh, believing in things that are flaky, things that are not in Scripture, things that are not backed up by good science. I remember one time after I gave a presentation, and I, I, forget, what I, I forget what I was uh, talking about, but I know I made an analogy to gravity. The, it, whatever I was pointing out was as obvious as gravity. You know, it's something you can observe in the present. And after that talk, believe it or not, somebody came up to me and said, well, there's no such thing as gravity. And he was totally serious, which, is, which, which flabbergasted me. I thought he was joking at first and, and you know, <laughs> kind of chuckled, yeah, yeah, no, no, there's no such thing as gravity. And then he started talking about how it's a conspiracy and everything. And I thought – and here, here, here is this man standing on the floor being held there by gravity telling me that it doesn't exist. Now, I mean, do you think I took anything seriously that he said after that? Well, you know, of course not. I mean, 
uh, he, he was denying something that's observable in the present, and that really makes his position look silly. Now imagine if somebody was witnessing, and they say, I'm a Christian, here's why you should believe in Christianity, and by the way, there's no such thing as gravity, or the earth is flat, or the sky really isn't blue at all. You know, things that, that are demonstrably false, that really would cause the person to say, well, maybe I shouldn't consider Christianity either. And so it's for that reason that I thought now might be the time to go ahead and, and uh, sort of nip this in the bud before it, it, it grows out of control. Right. And, and what concerns me, too, not only is it going to persuade those on the outside, hey, these guys are kind of a little flaky, right? And they're, they're considering these things that are so strange, but also it also could lead astray somebody within the faith. Yeah. Um, I could see that somebody could put their trust in this and come to find out later, again, demonstrably that the earth is a sphere. And next thing you know, they doubt is cast upon God's word and they walk away from the faith. So yeah, it, it is a dangerous thing. And like I said, I was so reluctant to do this, but then as I continue to get questions, I thought, gosh, this really is gaining steam. This is actually, there are people out there that are firmly set on this. And as I started reviewing their arguments, I realized that they do have a little bit of complexity to them. So they really do need to be addressed. So yeah. I guess on that note, um, one of the things that they teach, uh, I, I guess one of the foundational teachings is that, like I mentioned, uh, there is this solid dome that goes over this flat disk that we call earth. Uh, and what they point at in the scriptures is the word uh, rakia. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it's for the firmament. And first of all, okay, what is, according to the Bible, what is this rakia, this firmament? The rakia, the, the expanse, is the thing that God created on uh, day two. And it's mentioned in, verse, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. That word expanse is rakia in Hebrew. So let, it's, it's a separation. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. Verse 7 says, God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and morning a second day. And then we read in verse 9, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And so the waters below this expanse, whatever it is, um, are the oceans, the seas. And that's, the Bible says that in verse 10, God, God called the dry land earth, the gathering of the waters he called seas. And so the expanse is the separation between the waters below it, which are oceans, the Earth's oceans, and the waters that are above. And there's some debate as to what the waters above are. Uh, I'll just give you my position. I think they're probably clouds. Clouds are liquid water, uh, water droplets in suspension. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that would make sense. There's water, there's water below. There's water above. We look, below, we look down, we see water. We see the ocean. We look up, we see clouds. That's water. And the expanse is the area between those two. But it's also used more generally because in verse 8 it says God called the expanse heaven. And the, the Hebrew word there is shamayim. And that's used uh, in a very generic sense uh, to mean things that are in our atmosphere, but also things that are beyond our atmosphere. The, the stars, for example, are placed in the, uh, in the expanse of the heavens. And so uh, basically, long story short, rakia means sky. <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. It's the, it's the visible sky. And, you know, people have said, well, you know, it means a solid dome. I can't find any text that would imply that anywhere in Scripture. There's, there's nothing in Scripture that would suggest that. Uh, it, it is, um, it's related to the word raka, which means to spread or stretch out. So, uh, and, and it makes sense, right, because God separated waters from waters, and so he stretched the, the space in between them. And it has kind of a meaning of thin or empty, even it's related to these other Hebrew words. But it, it, it doesn't imply a solid dome, not at all. It basically just means the sky. Yeah, and I, I actually intend on probably hitting this subject one more time after this podcast and uh, getting into so many of these scriptures. There's so many of these scriptures that are used. And um, every single time when you look at it in context and you take all of scripture into account, you know, really apply hermeneutics to what we're looking at, you find that it does not imply a solid dome, but they do have a few scriptures that they look at, and and I'll get to those in another podcast. But um, okay, in Daniel chapter four verse eleven, 
uh, and, and also in, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 20, it says there was this tree. There's The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. Um, you know, this is one of the, the uh, uh, visions. And so they argue that one could see or, or one could not see a tree from the end of the earth if the earth was not flat. Therefore, it must be a flat earth. Uh, what would you say to that? <laughs> they've made a horrible mistake in hermeneutics, if that's how they're t- interpreting that, because uh, uh, they've actually committed the genre fallacy. The fa- the, pardon me, the genre fallacy. Uh, Daniel 4:11 is Nebuchadnezzar describing a dream that he had, and in his dream there is a tree that reaches unto heaven, and and all the ends of the earth can see it. And so, to interpret a dream as teaching us something about the physical universe. Uh, I think is is rather absurd. In fact, uh, when Daniel comes and interprets the dream, he doesn't interpret it as teaching us something about physics. He interprets it as teaching us something about what's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact, the tree represents uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and the fact that it's going to be cut down indicates that his glory will be taken away from him for a period of, uh, you know, I think it was seven years. Um, and so, in, in fact, the Bible says in uh, all the living creatures fed themselves from it. And so are, are we to take that literally, or are we to take it that all the creatures on earth came and fed on Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, no, we're, we're to understand this is, a, this is a dream, and the height of the tree and the fact that it can sort of be seen from everywhere indicates the extent of his kingdom. And again, it's not meant to be pushed in the literal sense because Nebuchadnezzar was not king over the entire earth. We understand that the Bible here is using a bit of hyperbole. It's exaggerating for the sake of making a point. The greatness of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is as if it were the entire world, but but it doesn't literally mean that it was visible to the the, um, Australian Aborigines, for example. And so to take that as teaching something about the physical universe is is just grossly mistaken. The same kind of thing happens in Daniel 2 where we we find a – uh, the kingdom of God is represented by a mountain that that starts as a boulder and then it it grows and grows and it fills the whole earth. And I remember when I was a little kid reading that and not really having my hermeneutic developed very well. I was thinking, well, how can a mountain uh, fill, fill the whole earth? You know, the earth being spherical or even if it were flat, how can a mountain fill the whole earth? It doesn't make sense. Well, it's it's representing the kingdom of God and it's in it's it, the way that it permeates the entire world. So again, this is this is a. Uh, uh, highly symbolic literature because we're reading about a dream and what it represents and Daniel gives the interpretation of it. Right. Amen. Uh, And and also another one that's brought up so many times is uh, the four corners of the earth. The Bible mentions the four corners of the earth several times. And so it gives you this impression that you almost have almost a a square and there's four corners and it's flattened out. Um, What do you think the Bible is saying when it speaks about these four corners of the earth? Yeah, this is mentioned a couple times. It's mentioned in uh, in Revelation, for example, and of course Revelation is a highly symbolic book, and I, I uh, recommend that people don't build their theology on Revelation. Uh, build your theology on the rest of the scriptures, and that will help you to understand Revelation. But in any case, it's uh, it talks about these angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds. Now, what does that mean? Are, are there Are there just four winds on the earth? And of course, if we think about that, well, there's you know you can have a north wind, a south wind, an east wind, or a west wind. But really, winds are some combination of those four things. That's a way of that's that's a way of symbolizing uh, all the different types of wind. And, and likewise, the four corners of the earth really are a reference to the four cardinal directions: north, south, east, and west. It doesn't mean that that's that the earth is a square. It doesn't mean that it has literal corners, but it's a reference clearly to the four cardinal directions. And that's used uh, symbolically, really, to represent the whole Earth. If you, you know, if you go, uh, you know, infinitely far north or south or east or west, I mean, you'll cover the whole globe that way, using some combination of those things. And in fact, this this expression is used, or or similar expressions are used throughout the Scriptures. And so, it really ought to be obvious to anyone who's who's very familiar with the Bible. But that, you see, that's the problem, isn't it? Most most people aren't very familiar with the Bible, and so they read Revelation as if it's historical narrative. It isn't. Uh, it's highly symbolic language, and it makes allusions to the Old Testament. Uh, in Genesis 28:14, for example, God speaking to Jacob, he says, your descendants uh, shall also be like the dust of the earth, and, and, and uh, you shall spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. Now, is, is that, does that mean that Jacob's descendants only spread in those four literal directions? You know, did they not go like, say, 
northwest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, clearly what that's indicating is it's, it's indicating an expansion in all directions, and it's using the four cardinal points as uh, as a representation of all that. It's a bit of synecdoche. Uh, Luke thirteen twenty nine, Jesus says, and they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Now, does he mean that, that, they are, that they're only coming from those court card, cardinal directions? Well, of course not. He, he means that to say they're going to come from everywhere, from all over the world. And so likewise, when Revelation is talking about the four corners of the earth, it means all directions, everywhere. It's a reference to the entire earth. And by the way, the interesting thing is most of the uh, folks that are trying to promote a flat earth today don't hold to a to a uh, square, right, so they, right. they, they wouldn't take these. They, they wouldn't take these verses to support their position anyway. Most of them are, are referring to the Earth as sort of a disc shaped without corners, and so they, uh, you, you won't find too many people using this or misusing these verses, I should say, to try and support their idea anymore. Believe it or not, many of the sites I looked at really did reference this four corners of the Earth. Uh, as one of the arguments, which I, I thought the exact thing. It was like, well, wait yeah. a minute. I thought this was supposed to be a disc. Yeah. Why are we talking about corners? But whatever the case, you know, whatever will work is, is what ends up getting li thrown into these lists of scriptures that will supposedly prove that point. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a very expansive list of scriptures throughout the Bible that speak of the ends of the earth. Um so many examples. Deuteronomy 28.64 mentions it. Uh, 1 Samuel 2.10 mentions. Uh, and Psalm 67.7. Just, I mean, to name just a few. Uh, the ends of the earth, as if, uh, you know, there is a, a end. If it's spherical, there's really no end. It just keeps going and going. You can keep spinning around the globe. What would you say to that? I mean, is that teaching a flat earth? Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to see how people could take it that way because, uh, you know, I understand that the Earth is round, but you can only go so far on the Earth because it's round. And so there, there is an end to how far you can go. You can go all the way back to your starting point, but that's it. And in, in a lot of these passages, like in, in Deuteronomy uh, 2864, where it talks about, you know, God will scatter you from one end of the Earth to the other end of the Earth. Well, you, pick, you can pick two points on a sphere that are opposite, and those are called antipodes. And I could imagine, yeah, going from one antipode to the other. That's going from one end of the earth to the other. Like, for example, going from the North Pole to the South Pole. That would be one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. Those are two ends. And you can't go farther north than the North Pole, and you can't go farther south than the South Pole. And so it does have an, an end to it. It's just it doesn't have an edge to it. I think that's maybe where people get uh, mixed up. But you can only go so far on the earth because it is because it is spherical. I don't think any of those verses suggest even remotely otherwise. It's it's so fascinating when you look at some of these writings, um, and and I'm not sure if they're suggesting that at one point you were just going to bump into a wall, you know that that solid dome where it it meets the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, okay, so we've looked at some of the arguments that they use to suggest that the Earth is flat. What would you say, as far as the Bible goes, what arguments could you make that the Earth is actually spherical? Scripturally. Yeah, I think it's very clear scripturally that the that the world is spherical, and there are a number of passages that uh, that teach this. Uh, one that I would normally point to, although uh, as I'll explain in a moment, those who believe in a flat Earth have a way of getting around this one. Uh, Isaiah forty twenty two would be one where it talks where God talks about the circle of the Earth, and the Hebrew word there uh, kug, basically meaning round or spherical. And uh, another one that I think is really hard to get uh, to interpret any other way is in Job 26:10, where it says that God has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. And what that's describing there is it's describing the the way that sunlight falls on the earth, the fact that uh, the you know the the perimeter, the boundary between light and darkness, which is what ast what astronomers call the terminator, where light stops or terminates. And that's anywhere on Earth where a person would be experiencing evening or morning. So they're, they're sun, the sun is right on the horizon. Anywhere on Earth where that's the case, um, that boundary is always a circle because the Earth is spherical, and there, there's really no other way to do it. And uh, and so the fact that it, and it, the fact that it's on the waters is, of course, because Earth's surface is mostly water. Now, with Isaiah 40:22, the flat Earthers will say, well, maybe that's referring to a flat disk. Um, and, I, and I will grant that the word might 
be interpreted that way in some instances. Actually, normally what they'll say is, it's, no, it's got to be a circle. It can't be a sphere. It's got to be a circle. And I point out that even there, they're taking liberties because a circle is two-dimensional. Uh, <laughs> and that can't be the case. The Earth, the Earth has structure to it. It's three-dimensional. And so what they really mean is that it's a disk. It has some thickness to it. A circle, right, has no thickness. It's two-dimensional. So even there, they're taking some liberties. And I think their insistence that the word uh, kug, the Hebrew word for you know the circle of the earth, that it, that it must mean a disk or a two-dimensional circle, uh, I don't think there's any scriptural support for that. The word is used only three times in the scriptures as a noun and one time as a verb. And in, in none of those you know, do, do we see an insistence that it would have to be uh, a circle. In fact, I think in some cases it, it wouldn't make sense to interpret it that way. Job 22.14 talks about God walking on the vault of heaven. The word for vault there is actually the same Hebrew word. It's kug. And it wouldn't make sense for God to be walking on a two-dimensional circle. It makes more sense if he were walking on a hemisphere. <laughs> and, of course, even there, it's, we're using metaphorical language, so to speak. In Proverbs 8.27, it says that God inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. Now, whenever you find the deep in the scriptures, that's the oceans. And so the, that there's a surface that, that the oceans are circular, that only makes sense uh, on, a, on a spherical world. And so I think even the verses that they would say, well, it has to mean a circle. Well, if you understand what a circle is and the way it projects on a sphere, yeah, the world, the, the, the earth has to be spherical in order for the, to, us to make sense of those verses. But I think Job 26.10 is really the killer, that God inscribes a circle on the surface of the waters of the boundary between light and darkness. There's just no getting around that one. Mm. Well, okay, so what about science? Has science been able to say this a little tongue in cheek, has science been able to irrefutably show us that there's a spherical earth? Yeah. In fact we got pictures. <laughs> and I think this is you know, it's it's just easy today because we're in the space age and we've sent we've sent spacecraft out there and they've turned around and taken pictures. Uh, it's, it, I have to tell you, there's a friend of mine here at ICR and he was doing a um, he was doing a conference and somebody at the end of the conference came up to him and was insisting that the earth was flat and and everything. Well, one of our speakers at ICR, one of our part-time speakers, is an astronaut. In fact, he's he's currently the commander of the International Space Station, uh, Jeff Williams. I actually had a live chat with him a few weeks ago, and I got to see him. It, we, we were Skyping, and he's on the space station floating around there. I, you know, I could see him floating. And, wow. Uh, yeah. And so my, my friend, when, when this when this guy was trying to convince him that the world's flat, my friend said, well, you know, I have, an, I have a friend who's an astronaut. He's on the space station right now. And the, the guy immediately, immediately said, well, is he a member of the Illuminati? And, uh, <laughs> and when we, when we uh, told Jeff that we emailed Jeff this, and uh, he said, well, secret, he, he laughed. And he said, well, the secret's out. I guess I can go home from the soundstage now where they're faking all this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, just, it's just hilarious. In fact, my, my friend Jeff Williams, he's actually taken more pictures from space than any other human being. And he has a, a wonderful uh, book on it. I think it's called The Works of Thy Hands. It's, it's, it's all these marvelous pictures of God's uh, glory that he's put into the earth uh, as seen from outer space. And there's no doubt to Jeff that the world's a sphere because he can look out the window and see that. And so I think it's, it's very obvious in our space age. The Apollo missions where people actually went to the moon and they, you know, there, there's some wonderful Apollo pictures. I love them of where they're, you know, they're flying over the the moon, and you can see the Earth in the background. It's clearly, it's clearly spherical. There's no doubt it's there. So, uh, with our modern space program, there's just no doubt about that. And I, and I think a lot of the folks who hold to a flat Earth and say, "Well, that's all a conspiracy," I don't think they realize what they're doing because they're calling their brothers in Christ uh, liars. Because many of the astronauts are Christians, including Jeff Williams, and some of the go some of the guys that went to the moon, Jeff or um, uh, Jim Irwin, for example, he was a Christian. And are you really going to call your brother in Christ a liar? Because you're really supposed to have two or more witnesses if you do that. And I don't think you're going to be able to find those. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and the conspiracy, that w I mean the magnitude of the conspiracy would have to be so absolutely vast. I mean we're talking about – Everybody that's been involved with these with these missions to space, not only here in America but anywhere else, who's anybody who's tried to send a rocket up, um, I mean, you could take it down to even just regular uh, pilots who fly airplanes. I mean, you'd think sooner or later one of them would figure out, wait a minute, this is a disc. Yeah. You know, yeah. we we lost Jimmy last week because he flew into the dome. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course, you the, know. The, the paths that airplanes fly as well, they're geodesics. They, they, 
uh, they're not the path you would take on on a flat disk. Uh, if you want to minimize, uh, you know, your distance in terms of, you know, do you travel over the North Pole or do, which way do you go? Well, on a sphere, the path you would take, you know, is different than the path you would take if it was a flat disk. And so it really just doesn't make sense in our modern age of technology. I mean, I lived in Colorado for years. You go to the top of a, one of the tallest mountains there, you can actually see the Earth curving curving down away from you. It's not that it's not that difficult to see, really. When I lived in uh, when I lived in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I, I would sometimes look at the uh, – I, I was fascinated by the beauty of the sunrises there because what happens is the uh, – I'm, I'm sure you know this – the sun uh, hits the top of the mountains first, and so the mountains look very bright. And then you see the, the line going down from the top of the mountain. It, goes, it gets lower and lower, but you still can't see the sun until it reaches the base of the mountain, and then finally you can see the sun come up. And that's because, of course, the Earth's curved. And uh, and so the tops of the mountains experience sunrise before the bottoms of mountains, and that was very obvious when I was living in Boulder. Right, you see that every day. Yeah. Uh, what about? Uh, I mean, if you observe stars through telescopes, they appear to be spheres. Um, I mean, absolutely, and anybody can go and get a telescope, you know, a decent little telescope. Uh, why would Earth be any different than that? Yeah, and that's you know that was one of the earliest arguments that the Earth might be spherical. I think it might have been Pythagoras that considered that because the objects in the heavens, as far as we can tell, are spheres, and almost all of them are. Uh, you, now, of course, with with a small telescope, you can't see any size to stars, but with some of the larger ones and with with modern technology, it is possible to actually get a uh, an image of the surface. It's it's not real high res, but we can do it of some of the larger stars and their spheres. And, of course, we know the sun's spherical, the moon's spherical. You can see, you can look at the planets. You can see Jupiter and Saturn. In terms of the actual planet, they're both spherical. Now, Saturn's rings are a disk, but they're not solid. But uh, most things in space are spherical, and it, it does make sense that the Earth would be the same way. Now, that's not a proof, of course, because God could have made the Earth different. There's no doubt about that. But uh, certainly there's plenty of evidence from astronomy, even if you're bound to the Earth, even if you don't have the luxury of being able to go into space like some of our friends have, have gone and to be able to see the Earth from above, you can nonetheless figure it out from the surface. Uh, by the shift of the stars, for example, if you go farther south, the North Star is lower, to, you know, closer to the northern horizon. And so when I'm here in, uh, in Texas, the North, I, this is the farthest south I've ever lived, and so the North Star appears lower in my sky, and conversely, stars that are further south, they appear a little bit higher. And there are some stars that I can see now that I couldn't see back when I lived in uh, in Colorado, for example. Canopus is a star that I get to see in, in uh, February in the evenings, and uh, I can see it because I live far enough south that the curvature of the Earth brings it up over my horizon. But from Colorado, it's not visible. Now, that that would not be possible on a flat disk. On a flat disk, uh, a star that one person can see all people can see. There's there's no other way that it could be that way because you can connect a line. You, you picture you know you picture a star up in space somewhere. If you can connect it to one line, if you can connect it to one point on a flat disk, you can connect it by a line to another point on a flat disk. And so what stars one person can see would be the stars that all people can see. And that's not what we observe. Uh, people that live in the southern hemisphere they get to see constellations that we can't see from the northern hemisphere. And that just wouldn't make sense if it were a if it were a flat disk. Right now, when you're when you're observing these planets with just a telescope, uh, you know, especially some of the ones that are closest clo closer to us, as they rotate, you're able to see different features on the surface of those planets as well. So you're able to tell that yeah, that's definitely a sphere. It's rotating, and you can see things. Yeah, um, that's especially true with um, with Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, sometimes Saturn. With Mars, it very clearly has surface features on it. And the neat thing about Mars is it rotates at about the same rate Earth does. And so well, it, it's kind of a weird sensation. You're watching Mars rotate knowing that you're rotating at about the same speed. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And so, oh, wow. it, yeah, and so it's fun to watch. Over the course of a night, you can watch it rotating as you're standing on a rotating Earth. And, uh, and of course, Mars' Mars's rotation is just a little bit slower than Earth's. It's actually uh, 24 hours and 37 minutes. And so if you come out the next night at the same time, Mars seems to have backed up by 37 minutes, if you, if you see what I'm saying. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's running, it runs slow. It's like a, a clock that runs slow. And uh, so you can actually plan based on what side of Mars you want to see. You can plan what night you want to go out to take a look at it and what time. And, uh, in fact, one time I actually did a, a complete rotation of Mars. I made an animation taking images of Mars 
uh, over the series of a, a month or two, and I got, you know, I got, you know, in short intervals, like five degree rotations, and I made a complete 360 degree rotating Mars from those images. And it was kind of fun, a fun project. Um, but yeah, we're rotating in the same way. Jupiter is real easy to see it rotate because it, it's got a fast, it's got the fastest rotation of any planet. It rotates in 10 hours, less than 10 hours. And so if there's any surface features on Jupiter that have a longitudinal dependence, and the great red spot is, is one of the most prominent, you can watch that red spot and you can watch it move over the course of an hour or two. I mean, if it's, if it's dead center and you're looking at it right now and it's dead center, you come back in, in an hour and it'll be definitely not dead center. It'll be, it'll, you can tell it's rotating. And sometimes even Saturn will develop storms on its uh, on its face on its uh, uh, surface there, and you can watch them rotate over the course of time. And, and Saturn rotates just a little slower than Jupiter. So yeah, all, everything else in space is spinning and is is generally spherical if it's a planet. And so Earth is Earth is we now know Earth is not an exception to that, and we have we have proof of that from space. We have we could have figured it out from Earth. In fact, people did figure it out from Earth, but uh, it's very very clear scientifically. Now, what about eclipses? Uh, do they not also show that irrefutably that, that the Earth is spherical? They really do, and this is one of the most ancient uh, methods that was used to demonstrate that. Uh, our ancient ancestors were really brilliant, and a lot of times because of evolutionary bias, we tend to think of our ancestors as being primitive. And Well, I mean, they didn't have the, the benefit of the fact that knowledge accumulates, and we can learn from them. They can't learn from us because they're gone. But uh, nonetheless, they were highly intelligent people, and many of them had figured out uh, how uh, the phases of the moon worked and such. Th they knew that when a lunar eclipse happened, that they knew where the sun was, and they knew where the moon was, and they knew that the Earth was in between the two. And so it was very clear that the, the lunar eclipse was being caused by the shadow of Earth falling on the moon. And no matter where the Earth – no matter you know, where the moon is – of course, the Earth's got to be in between the sun and the moon to have an eclipse. But no matter where it is, uh, the shadow that falls on the moon is always a circle. And that, would, that could only be the case if the Earth is spherical, because a sphere always will project a, uh, you know, a circular uh, shadow. But if the Earth were a disk, then that could only happen if the moon was directly overhead. If the moon was at any other position in the sky during a lunar eclipse – then the Earth, if the Earth were a, 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 you know, a round disk, it would project as an ellipse, a squashed shadow. And so the fact that lunar eclipses always project a, a circle in, is an indication that the Earth is spherical. And that was, one of, again, one of the earlier proofs, and people readily accepted it. A lot of people think that the idea that the Earth was round is something that Christopher Columbus came up with and that he was you know, the first to demonstrate that, but that's not the case. People have known since very ancient times that the world was spherical. Apparently, the Hebrews knew it based on Job 26:10. Uh, Job being about the oldest book of the Bible to be completed anyway, so the Hebrews knew that. But even by the time of you know 500s, 400s BC, Pythagoras, I think is I think he's around 500s BC, um, and he he figured that out. And then Ar Aristarchus and others contributed to that. E Eratosthenes was a Greek who actually calculated the size of the Earth, and his method was absolutely brilliant. He noticed that the height of the sun at noon on a given day of the year, I think it was the summer solstice, it, it, that the sun was directly overhead in one city, but it was not directly overhead in another city. And the only way that could be is because the world is uh, is actually spherical. Well, you could get something like that on a disk, but you wouldn't get the right you wouldn't get the right uh, angles. And so the fact that you have a uh, a spherical disk, or I'm sorry, a spherical surface, and he calculated the angle difference and was able to actually extrapolate and figure out the circumference of the Earth to within about 10% of the right answer. is really remarkable. So people, in some sense, were, were brighter than people are today. They were able to figure these things out, uh, even though they didn't have the, the modern technology that we have today to be able to actually go into space and take a picture of it. How Okay, one of the things that I've seen is I'm reading through so many of these different blogs and watching videos, uh, many of the uh, people that are part of this Flat Earth movement are teaching that the stars are actually really small and that they're embedded in this solid rock, rockia dome that's above our head. Uh, how can we know that the stars are actually, in fact, massive? 
Well, there's, yeah, okay, there's, there's a lot that we know about stars because of the uh, field of astronomy, and in particular a branch of astronomy called spectroscopy, which breaks up light into its uh, constituent colors. It actually tells you about the source. It's kind of like a, whenever something gives off light, it gives off a sort of fingerprint, and we have ways of reading that fingerprint, and it tells you what the source of the light is. Uh, now, there's lots of things that I could say about that, but one of the things that we know is that stars are not solid. They're made of hydrogen gas. And so they're not, you know, they're not little, you know, crystals or glowing crystals or something like that. They're very, very hot hydrogen gas with helium and a few other elements, but mostly hydrogen. And we can tell that because of that atomic fingerprint. Now, we know that stars are not close to the Earth because of a, a, a thing called parallax, which basically means that if, if two people were standing at, uh, let's, let's say, at a great distance, and one of them, the star, is directly overhead, if, if you run a flat disk, the other person, if the star was close, would not see the star directly overhead. It would be at an angle and uh, because the star is close to the surface of the Earth. But that's not the case if the star is very, very far away. And we can actually use parallax and compute the distance to the stars. And so one, one of the ways that we know that the stars are not sort of all at the same distance on a sphere is because we can actually, we can actually measure different parallaxes for different stars. And what that proves is that stars are at different distances. Uh, just sort of to illustrate this, you could imagine if you uh, if you hold your finger out at arm's length and, and and you know put it against say a window or some something outside, maybe a tree outside, and you blink your eyes back and forth, your left eye and then your right eye back and forth, you'll see that your finger will shift relative to the tree in the background, and that's very much like the Earth when it's on one side of the sun versus the Earth when it's on the other side of the sun. The nearby stars are like your finger; they will shift back and forth relative to the more distant stars. And we're actually able to measure that today. And it's a very small shift, which means that stars are very far away. And the fact that different stars have different shifts means they're all at different distances. And so that eliminates the possibility of the, there being sort of a, a single sphere with little pinpricks in it or, or little jewels embedded in it or whatever you have. They're all at, the stars are all at different distances, and we can now demonstrate that scientifically. And so we're able to tell that they're, they're actually uh, not only large, but they're very far away. They're not just embedded in some dome that's nearby. Right. Once, once you know the distance you can actually compute the size because of the brightness. Uh, you see, there's a certain rule in, um, uh, in terms of the way, when, when, think, when you heat up something, it'll give off what's called black body radiation or Planck radiation. And uh, you know, you've probably seen that. Maybe you've seen metal that's heated really hot. It actually glows kind of red. If you could make it even hotter, it would glow uh, brighter and it would change color. It would actually become more yellow and then white. And then if you can heat it really hot, it would be bright blue. And so we know what the temperature of stars are just based on their color. Stars work the same way as metal or anything else. Basically, anything that glows pretty much works that way. And so we know they're hot, and that, means, that tells us how much energy they're giving off per unit area. And we know the distance to the star. And so based on how bright it appears, you, it's actually possible to compute mathematically how big the star is. And I won't bore you with the details, but it, it, it is possible to do it. And it's just basic geometry and physics. And we can do this. This is the kind of stuff we can do in a laboratory. It's not that difficult to do. What other arguments coming from science uh, are able to show that there is a spherical Earth? Well, I think the uh, you know the big ones. I think the fact that we're able to go into space and we're able to see it. I think that's that's just very compelling. Uh, time zones. If you've ever if you've ever traveled from time zone to time zone, it's very obvious that the world is spherical because the sun has set for in some parts of the world where it's still up, and other parts of the world. Now, if you think about it, that would not be possible on a flat disk. On a flat disk, if the sun is set for one person, the sun is set for all people on that disk. And so you cannot have, you can't have time zones in the sense of having it night in one place and day in another on a flat disk. It's just not possible. You'd never see the sun set. And, I, and I've seen some of the, the illustrations that some of the flat earthers have put with it, where they have the sun kind of like a searchlight uh, that's, that's suspended above the Earth, and it sort of goes around. It makes a little circle. But if that were true, you would never see the sunset, because in their view, the sun never goes below the horizon. But we do see sunsets, you see. And so it's very clear on, on that basis. And again, that's one you can do uh, you know, on the surface of Earth. One of the first physics problems I did as an undergraduate, I was probably just a freshman, and uh, it was, I, I remember doing this because it, it was a neat concept. If you go to the beach and you're watching a sunset 
and let's say you're lying down and you're watching the sun set and as soon as you get that last little bit of sunlight as soon as that last little sunlight flickers out you stand up now if you stand up this, you, you'll be able to see the sun again because of the, sphere, the, the spherical nature of the world and it turns out that you'll be able to watch the sun set a second time and, and the difference between the two is only about seven seconds but from that period you can actually compute what the size of the earth is and it's a neat it's a neat thing to try and i actually did something oh, wow. like that when i when i visited a um, i remember it was at uh, uh, I think it was at Myrtle Beach, and we were watching. A, you can do the same thing with a sunrise. And we were staying on. We were staying in a, um, you know, one of those real tall, uh, you know, condominiums that they have there. And uh, of course, you can see the sunrise before the people on the beach can see the sunrise because of the curvature of the Earth, because the ocean curves down due to the spherical nature of the Earth. And not only can you see that the Earth's spherical that way, but you can actually compute the size of it. Hmm. That sounds like a lot of fun that you could have with the kids. Yeah. Uh, Sit at the beach. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, going back to the Bible, something I wanted to mention uh, that I didn't mention earlier, as I was reading through many of these websites, uh, many of them were basing their arguments uh, partly on uh, ancient Near East documents. Mm. They would look at some text that's outside of the Bible and, um, th for example, they would look at uh, um, some text from one of the nations surrounding Israel and how they viewed the earth. Yes. And then they would say, well, the Israelites must have viewed it in that sense as well. Yeah. And so they start importing these ancient secular, ancient Near East uh, document ideas into the scriptures and and in essence are reinterpreting the bible in light of these texts and i'm seeing that not just in this movement i'm actually seeing that starting to happen in uh, many different movements out there yeah. uh, what do you think of that as a as a uh, valid or invalid hermeneutic and is that dangerous it's definitely invalid. It's definitely dangerous, and it, it's it's something that concerns me. And I probably need to write I probably need to write some articles on this topic. But uh, it seems to me that that view that oh well we need to look at what the other folks believed at that time and then interpret the Hebrew scriptures according to that. It seems to me that that idea tacitly presupposes, in essence, even though people wouldn't admit to it, it, it supposes the Bible's not inspired by God. It supposes mm -hmm. that these people are just making up the things that the Bible teaches based on what, what these other cultures have done. And, and, and see, if the Bible is inspired by God, then there's no reason for God to borrow the incorrect astronomies from other cultures to try and teach his people the truth. That wouldn't make any sense anyway. God does not use error to teach truth. Now, he does use si simplifications of truth to teach truth, but he doesn't use incorrect ideas that have been imported from other cultures to try and teach you know hebrews about some some spiritual thing no god is god is the source and author of all truth and so when he tells us something about the way the the physical universe works we can trust that and so there just isn't any basis for thinking well the hebrews probably thought about the universe the same way as the pagans uh, i don't think so they had they knew they knew the living god and so there's no reason for them to ascribe to um, or, or, or capitulate to the the pagan notions of the day. Now, some of them probably did. But scripture would not be subject to that error. All scripture is inspired by God, and so when when we read scripture, we need to read it in light of what God has said, and not based on the fallacious thinking of the cultures of the people that lived around the Hebrews. Amen. Well said. Okay, so if there's somebody who is. Uh... What would you say to a friend or a family member who's getting involved with this movement? You know, I, I think the first thing I'd say is uh, that that uh, this person, you know, I'd say, you know, brother, you're not reading the Bible right. That's that's the first thing. We need to. Uh, you're not being faithful to the Word of God, because I my suspicion is the folks who uh, mistakenly hold to this the, the flat Earth idea. They I think they're under the impression that they're sort of taking the moral high ground, that they're reading the Bible and, and the rest of us are just compromising. But I would suggest it's just the opposite. I would say that you haven't really been faithful in your interpretation of Scripture. And that's you haven't interpreted the way the author intended. You haven't interpreted the way God wants you to interpret it. And then I would go through and teach them a little bit about hermeneutics. I think that's the first thing I would do before we get to the science. Right, because, right. Be, you know, because, you know, there are things that the Bible teaches that, that, 
the majority of scientists today would disagree with. And I, I, mm-hmm. I, I'll grant you that when the Bible clearly teaches something, we need to go with what it says because it's the infallible Word of God. But the Bible just doesn't teach a flat earth. It just doesn't. The verses that people like to go to, uh, mostly they're in poetic literature, and they're trying to, to pull a, a cosmology out of a poetic passage that's really teaching something else entirely, or, or prophetic literature that uses lots of symbols and figures of speech. Um, or, or they don't really understand the meaning of a Hebrew word, or they'll they'll assume that a Hebrew word has a very limited range, when in fact Hebrew words tend to have a pretty broad range of usage, probably more so than English words. And so there are lots of hermeneutical fallacies that people uh, commit. And, and I'll grant, they're, they're trying to be faithful to the Word of God, but I would point out that, that they really aren't being faithful to the Word of God, and then we'd go back and do some hermeneutics. I think that would be the first thing that I would do. And then after that, then we could talk about some of the science, and we could see how this science actually confirms passages like Job 26.10, where it indicates that God inscribes a circle on the face of the waters. You, I've got pictures, Apollo pictures, where you can see the, the, you know, the sunlight hitting the, the waters of the earth, and, and it traces out a circle because the earth is spherical. And so I think then I would, you know, I would move to the science and talk about some of that and point out that there have been many Christians who are astronauts who have gone into space and have seen this with their own eyes. We have pictures of it. You can demonstrate it mathematically. You can demonstrate it based on the way stars move. You can go to the southern hemisphere and see stars that you can't see here, which would be impossible on a flat, flat Earth. You can see the south celestial pole, which is impossible on a flat, uh, a flat disk in terms of the way the stars move. Um, so it really just isn't excusable to believe in that in this day and age. Right. Amen. Now, looking at your website, uh, there are many books. None of your books directly deal with this topic, but many of your books are going to address it in roundabout ways, no yeah. pun intended. Uh, you know, you have your, your, <laughs> your Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, great book, Taking Back Astronomy, love that book. You also have your, your DVD, Astronomy Reveals Creation. Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with the solar system, God's Heavenly Handiwork. I'm not familiar with that. Um, but yeah, is there any of those publications that might, uh, any of those books that might be a good resource for those who are questioning whether or not uh, to buy into this flat Earth versus spherical Earth? Yeah, I think any of those would be helpful. Uh, certainly, taking back astronomy. Now, again, in in all of those ones, I haven't specifically dealt with the issue because, you know, as you pointed out, this it just this wasn't an issue even just a few years ago. I, I hadn't heard of anybody that held to this position. So for some strange reason, it's gaining prominence. Even within the last year, it seems to have gained some sort of support. I I don't know why. But uh, certainly taking back astronomy will give people uh, an understanding of the basics of how um, how God has organized the universe, how he's created it, and and, uh, the shapes of things in it. Uh, Also, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, the first two chapters in there describe how motions in the sky work. And I would say that 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 motions in our night sky would be absolutely incomprehensible if the earth were a disk and if the heavens were merely a, a disk or a dome spinning above it. Uh, because things like the, the south celestial pole, you cannot have that on a flat earth. You would never be visible. And so uh, things like that, I think if you, if you read that and you really understand how motions work in the sky, you can see that it, it, it simply won't work on a, on, a, on a flat disk earth. It has to be spherical in nature. And then another one, too, that... Um, my, my book, Understanding Genesis, which is really mm. a, a book on hermeneutics. We talked about that last time. Um, mm-hmm. that's, that's, it's showing you how to read the scriptures. I think that's probably, <laughs> but, uh, had, had, the, uh, had the flat earth been an issue at the time, I probably would have included a section on that too. But you can at least see how, in principle, you, can, you could um, refute some of these, these positions that are really not biblical by going back to a proper understanding of scripture and applying proper biblical hermeneutical methods. Yes, amen. Well, Dr. Lyle, it once again has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, You're always a wealth of information, and uh, yeah, absolutely loved it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.